Hello everyone, welcome again to another video of biological concepts and today and today we will go to talk about something that is related to our discussion last time. So if we happen to find our we did find out already that the earth has um, has a factor in the evolutionary changes of the organism he, organisms here on earth. So with that we will try to find out other evidences that can link to the evolutionary changes or that uh, that serves as a proof that evolution on organisms or any living things here on earth is somehow possible. Alright, so with that, we will now discuss on this lesson the evidences of evolution. Let's get started. Alright, so what do you mean by evidence? Evidence is the available body of facts or information indicating whether the belief or proposition is true or valid. So, in this particular lesson, we will try to find out if Char really Charles Darwin, uh, if his idea about evolution is really true. So, uh, aside from the, aside on how the earth affects the evolutionary changes of the organisms here on earth, we will try to look for other proof of evolution that is stated by Charles Darwin on his theory of, of evolution. Alright, so... Let's start. Alright, so these are the evidences of evolution that we will go into uh, discuss in this particular uh, lesson. So the first one is biogeography followed by the comparative anatomy, followed by comparative embryology and molecular biology. How are these evidences be able to link to the evolutionary changes of the organisms? Alright, so can we use this or the question that we have right here before we go to the next slide, uh, can we use these evidences to truly, uh, to truly uh, uh, conclude that evolution on organisms here on earth happens? Alright, so with that, let's start. We will start first with biogeography. Now, what do you mean by biogeography? From the word itself, so bio means life and geography is landform. So, meaning to say that we have here uh, the life and landform. So, meaning to say, if we uh, have this one, this is the this is the study of how the or how the species or how the organisms are distributed geographically. All right. So meaning to say, each and every places here on Earth, how are these organisms are distributed geographically? All right. So let's start. So this particular evidence or this particular evidence is in connection with the formation of the Earth. Why? It's because of one thing. Because Earth has something to do with the distribution of these organisms around this or all, all on all places on this planet. So why? It's because of one thing, the tectonic plates action. Alright, so and including the earthquakes, the for mount, uh, mountain formation, volcanic eruption, so on and so forth. So these particular factors which uh, led to the earth or the formation of the seven continents that we know, so led to somehow uh, affect also somehow the organisms that live on this certain land area or land or places that we have right here. So that is the reason why that organisms are distributed or scattered around this planet. All right. So, all right. So we have here some uh, examples of organism based on biogeography. Now, what we have right here is some of the flightless birds. All right, that are found in each and every continent that we have right here. So, what are their similarities? They are flightless. Now, uh, why are there, or why are, uh, why are there, as uh, flightless birds scattered on these continents that we have right here. One answer is because of the action of the continent or the tectonic plate action or uh, somehow that the continents move with the action of these tectonic plates and that's the reason why uh, probably uh, this particular flightless bird has one common ancestor and eventually because of the action of the tectonic plates that leads to the that leads to the continental uh, separation so this particular group of flightless bird are now adapted to several locations to which the continents are located now not only these flightless birds we have here the anteaters Alright, so these anteaters, although they are similar, they are all anteaters, but they look different from each other. 
because of one thing they are geographically scattered around this plant around the globe all right so not only that and also this uh, organism which is called the camels right so if you happen to notice there are some camels that have two humps and there are some camels that are that uh, that has one hump and uh, the one that we have here which is called the llamas all right so this is a camel that no uh, that is no or that doesn't have any hump at all all right so maybe because it is uh, de it, it depends on what environment that this organism lives all right so technically that these organisms are related to each other but they look differently because of their geographical distribution around the globe all right so that is biogeography all right the next second next set of evidence that evolution happens is the comparative anatomy so when we talk about uh, when we talk about comparative anatomy so we compare all right we compare the structures of these particular organisms that we have right here all right so all right before we go to the next slide so my question here are the organisms somehow exhibit similar structures all right if they do exhibit similar structures are they similar in terms of their function all right so that's the question that we will go going to answer in this particular lesson that we have right here all right so we have here similar but different so um it, it's bit uh, it is a bit uh, confusing. It is similar but different. So, in different in what ways? Alright, so let's take a look at this uh, picture that we have right here. Uh, this picture is a polar bear. So, this one is a polar bear and this one is a grizzly bear. Now, as you can see, they are completely different in terms of fur color. And in terms of the environment they live in, they are also different from each other. Alright, but, but they are similar. They belong to the bear family. All right, so they they share the same family, and these are bear family. All right, so or ursa. All right, so all right, so this particular organism they look different, but they belong to the same group of organism. Next one, we have this uh, one. So dolphins and fishes lives underwater. All right, so even though these are fishes and these are mammals. Alright, but they share, or although they are different, they share similarities like the fins, alright, so the flip, uh, we have here the flippers, alright, so streamlined body, so on and so forth. So streamlined body enables them to swim underwater uh, much efficiently than on the surface. So meaning to say that uh, this particular organism, they are different, but they have uh, somehow similarities in terms of their structure. So... We go now, so based on those pictures, there are concepts behind what is or there are concepts behind those pictures that I've shown you earlier. Alright, so we have those structures, one which is called analogous structure. So when we call a structure or a body structure analogous, these are features of different species that are similar in function but not necessarily in structure and which do not derive from common ancestral features and which evolve in response to the similar environmental challenge all right <coughs> let me put this let me put the it uh, let me put this one in this uh, this in this um, uh, let let me put it this way all right so if the organisms if we have two organisms of different species but they live in one uh, they live in a similar environment so what happens whatever environment all right what in what whatever environmental challenge they live in they tend to develop this uh, this certain structure which not necessarily the same in uh, uh, which which necessarily not the same in uh, not the same in uh, morphology or something like that. They develop this structure which is which has to be a similar function but not in morphological structure. So what does it mean? So if an organism is uh, if the two organisms are different and they live on a same environment, so what happens is they develop. A structure with similar function but not necessarily its morphological structure we called it the analogous structure so what are these analogous structures so what do we have right here is a bat wing 
and an insect wing. Alright, so as you can see, the insect wing and bat wing is used for flying. And also with the bird wing. Now, if you compare the bird wing and then the insect wing, they are both for, uh, for flying. Alright, uh, the organism that use this kind of structure, that use this kind of organ, is for flying. But, uh, as you can see, the bird's wing and the bat wing is made up of bones, while the insect wing is made up of membranes and even there are, uh, there are blood vessels in it. Alright, so meaning to say they are completely different from each other. But they have the same function. Alright, but they have the same function and that is for flying. That makes this one analogous. Alright, next one. Uh, another one is analogous structure. The eye. Alright, so the eye of the uh, squid and the eye of human. So they are similar in terms of function but different in structure. Alright, so if you look closely at the eye of the squid, it has structure that we can find in the squid but we, we cannot find on the human eye. So the human eye is far more complex than this one that we have right here. So this uh, squid. Okay. So, those are the homologous structure. So, next one is the homolo uh, an I mean analogous structure. Next one is the homologous structure. Now, what do we mean by homologous structure? These are structures, basically the same, same basic uh, morphological structure, meaning to say uh, the, con the components, alright? So, it has the same components and one embryonic origin. So, meaning to say when the organism is an embryo, it has the same origin to which the part develops. Alright, so, but, but, one thing is uh, different here from the analogous. Even though they have the same basic structure, but the function is not the same. Alright? So, the use of that particular organ is not the same. So, is that possible? Yes. We have it right here. So, one of the example here, of the homo one of the example of homologous structure is the hands of uh, primates. So, tarsiers, gibbons, chimpanzee, and humans, uh, as you can see, they have a similar uh, structure, but, <coughs> excuse me, they have similar structure but completely different to what purpose are they using this one. So, the human hand is for, uh, the purpose of human hand is for every, uh, I think for everything. Alright? So, the gibbon is for climbing up trees and the other one, the chimpanzee is for climbing trees and for walking uh, on land. Alright? Next one, the tarsier is for uh, attaching themselves firmly on the tree tops. Alright, so meaning to say they have different function, but the bone structure of this uh, of this particular uh, organ are the same. Alright, next one. We have here the wings of the insect. Alright, so different insect uh, group. So we have the diptera, lepidoptera, and coleoptera. So they have membranous wings. Alright, they have membranous wings and probably, alright, probably uh, they share common ancestor and probably that their ancestors are four-winged ancestor and also has membranous wings. Alright, so they have the same function, alright, so they have the same structure but basically they have uh, different functions after all. Alright, so next one. Okay, so we have the limbs of uh, animals. So we have human limbs, uh, cat limbs, we have uh, whale flippers, and uh, bats uh, wing. Alright, so as you can see, they are made up of bone structure, but this bone structure, whether you believe it or not, they are the same. Alright, so they are the same. We have the radius, the ulna over here. Alright, so... The radius and ulna are, are seen on all organisms that we have right here. Alright, so, and also the tarsals, the one that makes up the bones in the fingers. Alright, so the tarsals are also the same on all organisms. So, what does it mean? It has the same structure but different function. Why different? Because the cat is used for walking and the human limbs is used for uh, whatever purposes that the hand use, that, the, that our hands is used. Next one, this is for, uh, the bat is for flying and the whale is for swimming. Alright, so basically they have different function. Alright, next one. 
Alright, so if you group them together, so we have the dragonfly, the bird, the penguin, and the seal over here. So let's start first with the dragonfly and the bird's wing. So the bird's wing is not homologous due to the differences in structure, but they are analogous. Why analogous? Because they have the same function. Alright, let's go to uh, birds, uh, bird's wing and the uh, penguin's flipper. Alright, they are homologous because they are made up of bones. Okay, <coughs> they are made up of bones. Basically, they, they make up the same uh, components. But it is analogous due to the idea that the whales, uh, or sorry, that the penguin's flipper is for swimming and this one is for flying. Now, let's take a look at this uh, two together, the penguin and the seal. So, they have homologous structure, which is the flipper for swimming. And also, they have the same structure. These flippers have the same structure and also... It has the same purpose. Alright? It has the same purpose. That makes it analogous to each other. So, it is for swimming. Alright? So, next one. The seal flippers are not analogous to the wings of uh, dragonfly and also not homologous due to the idea that this one is made up of bones and this one is made up of membrane. Alright? So, that is the evolution by structures. And not only that, we include the other one here which is called the vestigial structure. Now, uh, these structures that is uh, somehow these are lost on all of its original function in organism through evolution. Alright, so meaning to say that these structures uh, through evolution or through, uh, no, through time uh, through time and through evolution the purpose of this structure seemingly they lost its purpose. Alright, so these are called vestigial structure. One example is the pelvis or the pelvic bone of the whale. So, as you know, that the whale doesn't walk on land anymore. So, when, we're, when will they or where will they use this one? So, if they are living on the water. So, basically, this pelvic bone is mostly seen on land animals like the giraffe, the, like the zebra, and so on and so forth. But in whales, it is now a vestigial structure, which means it has no purpose at all because of its environment that they live in. Next, uh, alright, so... That is evolution by structure. So there are different types of evolution by structure. So how do uh, how do these structures uh, evolve, or how do these structures came to be? All right. So probably uh, we have here the convergent evolution. So one type of evolution is called the convergent evolution. So this is uh, the acquisition of same biological trait through unrelated lineages. For example. Alright, so for example that we have right here, uh, an organism A and organism T which is not related to each other but they share something, probably a body part. Alright, so let's use a body part. So, so they share something and that is similar body part. Similar body part. Alright, so meaning to say that they have, uh, they have homologous or they have analogous structure but they are completely different from each other. Alright? So, they are different, uh, completely different from each other. Example of this is the dragonfly and the bird. Alright? So, the bird has wings and dragonfly has wings, although they are different organism. Alright. Next one. Alright. Uh, what we have right here is the comparison between uh, wolf and Tasmanian tiger. Right, so the one that we have right, he right here. So this is the bone of that Tasmanian tiger. So as you can see, uh, if it, if I don't, uh, if I didn't, uh, if I didn't uh, identify the organism that we makes up this bone, you cannot identify or you cannot say that these are a completely same organism. So you can say that they are similar. Alright, so they are similar to each other. So based on how the structures are arranged, respectively. Alright, next one. Alright, so this is the Tasmanian tiger. And yeah, okay. Next one, we have the koala and the uh, and humans. Yeah. Alright, so koalas are mammals and also humans. Alright, our humans are also mammals. But uh, we are um, we are completely unrelated from each other. Alright, so we are completely unrelated from each other, but we say uh, we share same characteristics, and they uh, these are having mammary glands and being warm-blooded some, somehow. 
Alright, next one. Alright, so the duckbill platypus and the bird. Alright, so the duckbill platypus is different from the bird because this is uh, a bird and this is a mammal. Alright, so but they share same trait and that is that the egg uh, that the platypus is an egg laying mammal and also the bird is an egg laying organism. Alright, so they share the same characteristic. Next one, the bird and the reptile. Alright, so bird and reptile and birds are different from each other, but but they share one characteristic, and that is the presence of scales on every body parts that we have right here. So the presence of these scales indicates that they both have the same uh, trait, but difference or they differ in terms of uh, lineages. Alright, that is the convergent evolution. Next one, uh, another one is the giant pangolin and some anteaters that are scattered around the globe. So, they share the same characteristics of being an anteater or having a structure that has, uh, that has uh, the ability to eat ants and termites and some sort. And they become different or their lineages are different. So as you can see in their uh, characteristics or physical characteristics, they are completely different from each other. Next one, some plants also exhibits uh, <coughs> some plants also exhibits uh, convergent evolution. All right, so some flowers or some uh, flowers are not yet are not that flower at all, and those are flowers that are uh, somehow a leaf. All right, and they use these leaves for attracting uh, purposes. All right, so in some cases, yeah. Okay, so that is. The other one is the cactus, alright? So, if this one is for attraction, alright, the cactus is for protection, alright? Their leaf is for protection and avoid the loss of or excessive water loss in a very dry condition of environment, alright? So, that is the convergent evolution in plants. Alright, next one is the divergent evolution. So, from the word itself, diverge means uh, to separate. Now, these organisms under the divergent evolution, they tend to be the same in terms of lineage. Alright, they are the same species, that we, the one that we have right here. They are the same species, but what happened is due to environmental differences, like... Uh, Maybe they, these or two organisms are isolated by the from each other by the environmental uh, factor, something like that. So due to some isolation, these two same um, these two organisms of the same species tend to develop different traits from each other. All right. So one uh, group group of organism that exhibits this one has a, what they call homologous structures, something like that. So if we recall, the homologous structure have the same structure but different in function due to the environment that they live in. So yeah, they develop a body part that are completely different from each other. So that is the divergent evolution from the word itself, diverge. Alright, so what we have right here, this is the development of uh, different colored butterflies that we have right here. So for different purposes after, uh, uh, at all, so that's the reason why butterflies develop into different uh, colors. As you can, or as you notice, uh, the butterflies that we you, that you observe are in different colors. All right, not all butterflies have the same colors of their uh, have the same colors of their uh, wings. Yeah. All right, next one. Okay, so um, what we have right here are examples of mammals, but the thing here is this is the counterpart of placental to the Australian marsupials. So the Australian marsupials, although they are mammals, they are both mammals, yeah. So they are both mammals, but they differ in how the how their reproductive system are uh, arranged. All right, so the one that we have right here on this side, these are placental mammals, meaning to say that this mamas tend to give birth on a live young all right so they tend to develop inside the body the young uh, the young develops inside the body while on the marsupials it develops outside the body and uh, all of these organisms have what they call pouches on their body 
Alright, so they have pouches. While on the other one, they don't have any pouches at all. Instead, they have placenta. So, that's the difference. So, this is a classic example of a divergent evolution in action. Alright, so for example, the mouse right here. We have placental mouse and also we have marsupial mouse. So, this mouse has a pouch similar to a kangaroo. Alright, so and the mouse that we have right here, which has placenta and it allows the young to be developed inside the body. Alright, next one. Alright, so the birds. Alright, so the finches, uh, the finches Darwin or Darwin observed in the Galapagos Islands. Although they are all finches, but they have different beaks uh, on each uh, that they have on their body. So for, the, for different purposes. For example, they eat seeds, they eat flowers, they eat insects and so on and so forth. Alright, so I repeat, so they are all finches, but they differ only by the uh, beaks that they have on their body. Alright, next one. There we go. So the finches that we are talking about earlier. So these are the finches that uh, Darwin observed in his uh, voyage in the Galapagos Island. Alright, next one. Alright, so we have uh, uh, another, uh, the third and last uh, type of evolution which is called the parallel evolution. Alright, so this is a type of evolution in which the development of similar trait, alright, in different but not closely related uh, species but descending from the same ancestor. Alright, so meaning to say, Alright, so meaning to say, uh, they have, or these two have the same ancestor, this is their ancestor, but the, um, alright, so they are not closely related to each other, so these two organisms are not closely re related to each other, but the, uh, as they go, uh, as they develop, as they, as they evolve, they tend to have similar traits. Alright, so meaning to say different organism but they have similar traits. Alright, so different organism but not closely related. That is what, uh, that is how parallel evolution works. So what do we have right here? So to, to give you a better perspective of how parallel evolution works. Alright, so another one, uh, again another example, we have the butterfly. Alright, so the butterfly's uh, wing have coloration or sabi na nat or we uh, we uh, we, we call it the the pigmentation all right so the pigmentation of these wings are uh, seen on all butterflies but they differ in just the design of how the pigment is uh, done in those wings that we have right here but Definitely, they have pigmentations, or that's that's the uh, that's the one that makes this one uh, look similar from each other. All right, next one. Uh, we have here the egg-laying mammals. All right, so these are egg-laying mammals, but they are not closely related to each other. This is a spiny echidna. All right, this is a hedgehog. All right, and, or sorry, this is a porcupine, and this is a uh, this is a hedgehog. Alright, so as you can see, alright, so the echidna is an egg-laying mammal, alright, so the hedgehog is a marsupial, and the other one, the porcupine, is a placental. Alright, they are not closely related to each other, but they develop similar traits, and that is the presence of spines all around their body. So this is a classic example of a parallel evolution. Next one. <coughs> Alright, so flying squirrels, sugar gliders, flying foxes, or something like that. So, or not, not, uh, let me clarify that, not flying foxes. Flying foxes are bats. Alright, so, alright, so this, uh, this group of organisms that we have right here, they are not closely re related to each other. They are not closely related, but the ability to fly using the, using a glider-like structures in their body enables them to be part of what they call, or to be part of what they call the parallel evolution all right so because of this part uh they resemble uh they are used for flying somehow and 
they're used for gliding from uh, three tops to three tops yan so these are uh, these are one of the classic example of uh, parallel evolution another one is the elephants all right so are the elephants elephants um, although they are uh, the, the ancestor of elephants they are not closely related to each other but the use or the structures that makes up this uh, this trunk that we have right here on their nose uh, makes them somehow uh, undergo what they call parallel evolution. All right, so they have the same purpose after all. All right, so although they have this different this different structure, but they have the same purpose on on, on the long run. All right, so those were the three types of evolution based on the structures of the organism. So again, this is what they call the comparative anatomy evidence of evolution. Next one is the comparative embryology. So from the word itself, uh, comparative means compare and we will compare the embryological development of every organism here. Now, uh, the question that we will leave here is, uh, the question that we will going to answer here is, are these organisms, alright, so... Are the organisms have, uh, if the organisms did evolve, if the organisms did evolve, do they have same embryological development? Alright, so now, what do you mean by comparative embryology? This is a study of structures that appear during the development of the organism, meaning to say the embryological development. So not necessarily the adult version of the organism, but we will look on the embryological development, the starting, the starting point of every organism, the embryological development. So what do we have right here? Now, if I remove this one, the one, the, 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 um, the name at the bottom, if I remove this one, can you classify which one is human, chicken, snake, salamander, or fish? Alright, so I bet you can. Because uh, both of the, all of them, you can, uh, as you see here, they all have, or they are all similar. They look like similar to each other. Alright, so what does it mean? It means that, uh, it means that not all organisms, or even though the, these organisms that we have right here, when they develop to become adult, they look different from each other, but in terms of embryological development, they have similarities after all. For example, the presence of postnatal, uh, all right, so not natal, post-anal tail that we have right here, the green one, is an indicator that we are all similar from each other. And not only the tail, but also the pharyngeal slits that we have right here, this one, the red one over here. All right, so this pharyngeal slits is similar to the gill slits that are found in the fish. All right, so... Okay, so this is uh this is one of the you know we never this is one of the uh one of the uh, uh good, one of the good evidence that evolution happens. So in this uh, in this particular picture, we can see that the as the we can see that the embryological development of an organism is related to the evolution of the organism itself. Now, what kind of organism? that this organism looks like or what are what kind of ancestor or how the how our ancestor looks like based on this picture probably it looks like this all right so it has pharyngeal gill slits and we have post anal tail all right so as you can see it this one is similar to this one all right so basically this is a lancelet all right, so this is a freshwater uh, organism. All right, so this is a freshwater organism, and this is its uh, post-anal tail, and the gill slits are somehow located here. <coughs> now, we, with the use of embryological development of all organisms, we can uh, somehow trace what kind of ancestor that this group of organism has long time ago. All right, so we can conclude somehow, we can hypothesize somehow that this, uh, this organism, their uh, ancestors, million years ago, looks like this. All right, so basically this is the statement that we got from some evolutionary biologists that we came, we all came from fishes, which is literally true because we have gill slits, the one that we have right here, we have gill slits and we have tail. Alright, so basically we came all came from fishes. So 
this is the comparative embryological uh, development evidence of evolution. Alright, so next one. The fourth and final evidence of evolution which is called the molecular biology evidence or biological or molecular bi biology or evidences in molecular biology of the organism. So what do we study here or what do we do here? Now, how can we use this one as an evidence? We can use the DNA itself because of the discovery of DNA uh, because of the discovery of the DNA by James Watson and Francis Crick. Now, we can now uh, find out that uh, if evolution can be possible through time on an organism. Alright, so with the use of the DNA and the uh, ability of the DNA to create protein, we can study the molecular basis of genes and gene expression to find out if evolution is possible. Alright, let's see if that is possible with this particular, uh, with this particular section. Alright, so uh, let's have the question here. What percent of genes do you share? Now, uh, during the 1990s, alright, so during the 90s, there is a, uh, there is a uh, monumental uh, achievement or there is a monumental project which is done by humans and that is the human genome project now what is the project all about this is to map out all the possible genes that are found in each and every organisms here on the planet and scientists found out that humans have only 20,000 genes all right humans have 20,000 genes and in some plants they have a hundred thousand more than the humans Alright, so meaning to say, uh, humans are not unique after all. Alright, so in terms of number of genes, in terms of number of uh, DNA coding or DNA coding, uh, uh, in terms of protein coding DNA, we are less than than those uh, other animals or other plants or other organisms here on the planet. All right. So in terms of this question, so how does molecular biology be able to answer if evolution happens on an organism? Now let's answer this question. All right. In humans, all right. In humans, we share. On a dandelion, we share 18% of our genes. So, meaning to say, 18% of dandelion's genes is similar to our genes, 18%. So, the rest of the, uh, the rest that is remaining is not the same anymore. Next one, the yeast share some characteristics of genes on our body, 26%. So, the rest is not uh, not the same anymore. The fruit fly has 44, the mouse has 92. So, meaning to say the mouse, we only have 8% difference between us and the mouse. And the chimpanzee, alright, so the chimpanzee has 98% difference in terms or similarity with our genes. So, meaning to say, we are just 2% different from them. Alright, and that 2% makes us, the one that makes us human. Okay, so, <coughs> so how did they know this? Alright, so, geneticists know this one because of the, because of DNA, basically. Without the DNA, without the idea of the presence of the DNA, we cannot uh, be able to uh, identify these things that we have right here. Alright, so... Now, aside from that, all right. So aside from that, we have also the we have also the uh, the amino acid that differs from human hemoglobin to other organism. For example, so we have here. Now, in in, in humans, also obviously we in other humans as well, we don't have any difference at all in terms of the amino acid the human hemoglobin have. But in rhesus monkey. Alright, in rhesus monkey, so we have only few differences on terms of, in terms of the hemoglobin amino acids. Now, in mouse, also a very few, but uh, in terms of differences, it's starting to become uh, more or become more different. Next one, in the chicken, it is uh, very different. In frog, also, it's very different. And uh, in the lamprey, which is a fish, all right, which is an aquatic organism, it is completely by far different. So this is the different 125. 
Alright, so the number of difference here is 125 to 1. Alright, so we meaning to say that we have uh, this particular amino acids can be seen on all organisms that we have right here. But, but, the catch here is they are different in terms of uh, polypeptide structure or something like that. Alright, next one. Alright, so if you're not satisfied on that, so let's take a look at this. So these are the gene sequence of each and every uh, organism that we have right here. We have human, chimpanzee, rat, guinea pig, cow, and dog. Now, as you can see, there are uh, genes that are that makes us similar to each other. And there are some codes or there are some nitrogenous bases that are completely different from each other. Alright, so for example, humans, chimpanzee, guinea pig, cow, and dog share the same nitrogenous bases on number 10 gene while the rat has different nitrogenous base on that portion and also on the 30th they have di they are different all right so in humans uh, let's take a look at the 100 uh, 100 uh, gene that we have right here now in humans we don't have a coding nitrogenous bases there but in other organisms they have Alright, humans and chimpanzee. Alright, next one. In humans and chimpanzee, also with guinea pig, cow, and dog, they uh, somehow they have um, difference with the rat, uh, rats uh, genes on 110 gene that we have right here. So basically, so basically, by the use of DNA and um, sequence of DNA and how the DNA uh, codes for protein, we be able to track down if this um, if this particular uh, DNA sequence have similarities to other organisms. So the the rule of thumb here, the rule of thumb here, the more the more nucleotides that the two organisms share together, meaning to say, the more they are related to each other. Alright? So, the more they are related to each other. So, meaning to say, human and chimpanzee, although we have still have difference of 2% in our genes, we can say that we are related to each other. Alright? So, the chimpanzee and then the human. But, not closely related to other organisms that we have right here. Alright, so that's uh, that's the beauty of the DNA. We can use them to f f find out that evolution is possible. Alright, so now, if you think that humans are unique, well, better change that word. You change that to most advanced. Humans are the most advanced organism, not unique. Because uh, in terms of number of traits and abilities, humans uh, are not unique after all on that. Why? It's because other organisms like the chimpanzee can do complex communication. If you think humans only do complex communication, well, uh, well you change that one. We are just the most advanced but we are not unique. Alright, so sense of humor also seen on some apes. Alright, the use of tools and other construction materials are somehow seen on ravens. Alright, long-term memories are seen on some birds like the Clark's nutcracker that we have right here. Counting is seen on chimpanzees. Self-awareness is seen on some uh, great apes, elephants, and other birds. Culture is seen in dolphins. Alright, and emotions... Not only humans have emotion, but other animals as well, like dogs, elephants, and other um, other same kind or other kind of animals. They have, they too have emotion. All right, and also, <coughs> all right, and also the one that makes us not unique. It's because we are outperformed in some other ways, like the speed. Alright, in terms of speed, we are outperformed by peregrine falcon, we have uh, the, the flying, bird, uh, flying bird that we have right here. The, in terms of running, we are also outperformed by cheetah and in terms of swimming, we are outperformed by this uh, shark that we have right here. Alright, in terms of eyesight, the eagles have 8 times sharper eyesights than humans. In terms of hearing, um... Whales have a lot of 
uh, will have powerful hearing than humans. And in terms of lifespan, we cannot argue uh, on this animal. Tortoises can live 200 years. Alright, so clams can live around 400 to 410 years. So we are outperformed in terms of that. And also with the size. So the, so the size of human is outperformed by the size of the whale. And also in terms of long distance running, so this is the only this is the only thing humans excel over other animals. In terms of long distance running, we can outperform other animals. All right? So uh, animals or humans can um, can do running for a longer period of time. All right? Animals cannot do that one. All right. So again, you you do not use the word unique here. You use most advanced. Humans is the most advanced organism here on the planet. All right. So with that, okay. So we are now we are we are now at the end of this lesson. So before we end this one, all right. So in this lesson, you have learned about the evidences of evolution and its four kinds, and you found out that uh, geographical distribution of organisms are somehow can be used as an evidences of evolution. Also, the molecular basis, like the DNA and the coding of proteins by DNA, is also used as an evidences of evolution. We can use the embryological development pattern of organism in order to find out the evidences of evolution. And finally, we can find out that there are some analogous, homologous, and prestigious structures that is present in some or, or that is exhibited by some organism in order to track down where, which organ or uh, in order to track down the evolutionary process that the organism undergo through time. And don't forget the three kinds of evolution or three types of evolution based on those structures that we have right there. So we have the parallel, we have the convergent, and we have the divergent evolution. Alright, so with that, these are all the evidences of evolution. So, before we end, it is not the strongest of species that survive, nor the most intelligent that survive. It is the one that is most adaptable to change that will survive. So, meaning to say, the one that is adaptable to every environmental challenge, according to Charles Darwin, is the one or is the organism that will survive on that particular environment all right so with that that ends up our discussion today and uh i hope you did learn something from this one now if you do have questions about this you can write it down in the comment section below all right so before that so i have a special shout out to my students here in Muntinlupa science high school so thank you for watching my video uh that uh created right here all right so with that don't forget to smile alright and we'll see each other on the next video. Alright, goodbye and have a nice day.